Happy Halloween, my fellow science obsessives. To keep things creepy and crawly, the inspiration for our show today is one of gothic horror lore's best sidekicks. You may know him from one of his many movie appearances. Your diet, Mr. Renfield, is disgusting. Actually, they're perfectly nutritious. You see, each life that I ingest gives back life to me. A fly gives you life. Certainly. That's Renfield, Dracula's loyal aide and a patient in an asylum with the habit of eating creepy crawlies. But there are actually lots of people who think there's nothing unusual about eating insects. There's a tree ant that's green and you kind of lick their butts, which I know sounds really weird, but <laughs> <laughs> they taste like citrus and they have this really nice like tang to them. I like fried termites very much. Crickets are also very nice. I want to try a honeypot ant. This particular ant harvests um, the sweet secretions of other insects. They almost look like grapes. They're so full of sweet, sugary yumminess. I'd eat them in a heartbeat. These folks aren't in an asylum. Nope, they're scientists. And just two of the people we'll meet to tell us why more of us should start eating bugs. And the excitement is stinging us at Nova Now, the podcast that flies through the web of news headlines to keep the buzz on science. I'm Alok Patel. This is where the magic happens. Okay. This is where we toast all our insects, and we can toast thousands and thousands at once. I paid a visit to a unique food business local to me in the Bay Area. I spoke to Monica Martinez, founder and owner of Don Baguito, one of the first edible insect food companies in the United States. You know, the edible insects seem to fall in the category of future foods and kind of like a new trend. I grew up in Mexico and we have a very strong pre-Columbian culture, pre-Hispanic before any Europeans came through um, America. Edible insects were part of our diet, um, same as venison, rabbit, duck. Um, so there were other alternative proteins like fish, right? We didn't have cows, we didn't have chickens, we didn't have pork. So that's what we're trying to rescue and revive edible insects as a food from the past. Um, Mexico is one actually the leaders. We have over 500 varieties of edible insects. I had to develop this kind of like thinking, okay, what's something less scary for people, somebody who hasn't never had an insect. Mealworm tacos. Uh, wax moth larva tacos. Wow. Yeah. Larva tacos, and you said? Toffee mealworm. Toffee mealworm ice, ice cream. cream. Yeah. And cricket tostadas? Yes. Oh my, that actually sounds delicious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mealworms aren't worms, but insects. The larva of the beetle, Tenebrio molitor. Most people think when you're talking about insects, they're like gonna be like juicy and saggy and something like that. I don't know. <laughs> and and this, this is the complete opposite. There's like a nuttiness and a crunchiness, not overbearing, great chocolate flavor. And I'm gonna look at the nutrition on this actually, cause yeah, is this three grams of protein per serving? And I'm eating chocolate. <laughs> okay, ready for this one? The coconut brittle baquito. Okay. That actually, wow. So these guys, mealworms are very like uh, rich in flavor. They're like nuts, like like almonds. And this one is also really good. Crunchy, has good texture to it. Okay, the first half of that taste, and I was like, I am just eating coconut brittle. This is really good. I've had it before. The latter half is where all of a sudden there's like a, a distinct nuttiness or something. And I'm like, oh, this is there's something special about this brittle. And the specialness is the mealworm. So there's no, like, should not even be a talk about it. It should be just like, shut up, open the mouth and eat insects because this is, <laughs> should not even be the future. It should be now. Let's eat them. <laughs> okay, enough snacking. Let's get into the science to help us properly appreciate these bugs. My name is Dr. Tanya Laddie, and I am an associate professor at the University of Sydney in Sydney, Australia. Um, I'm an entomologist, which means I'm a scientist that studies insects uh, and other invertebrates. I mean, I love, love, love insects. Tanya Laddie argues that it's difficult to be an animal lover and not love insects. After all, insects make up 80% of all animal species. 
So we think insects and we're thinking cockroaches and mosquitoes and, and oh, this time I had flies in my house and it was terrible. And we forget that there are such huge diversity of insects and they're out there doing all these really important jobs for us. Things like chocolate wouldn't exist without insects. Sold. What would we all do without chocolate? A large chunk of our food, and particularly all the things that are really delicious, those things are pollinated by insects. You know, if we didn't have cockroaches and flies and things moving around underfoot, we'd be drowning in our own waste. You know, they're nature's waste management crew. So they help feed us and clean up after us. It's really unfortunate that we tend to associate insects with just those very, very, very small number of species that cause problems for us. Insects kind of form a really important part of the you know, the, the web of life or the food pyramid because lots and lots of things eat them, lots of things. So birds, mammals, reptiles, all these groups that people really love, a lot of them are dependent on insects for food. And even if they're not directly dependent, then the things they eat are usually dependent on insects for food. I don't expect everybody to love them, but hating them is dangerous. <laughs> and here's someone who started out treating bugs as pests, and he's now one of their biggest champions for their nourishing potential. Arnold van Haus is emeritus professor at Wageningen University in the Netherlands. I'm retired, but that means that I have all the time in the world to dedicate myself to edible insects. He's a tropical entomologist. 27 years ago, he was studying how to protect crops from insects. But in Niger, he learned something unexpected. They told me that uh, the women make more money by selling uh, the grasshoppers than by selling their millet. That surprised me so much because I had been in Niger for three years. I didn't know this. So it was the first time people told me about eating insects. And when I came to the Netherlands and I gave my first talk about this, I think in 1996, people were astonished. He turned his focus to edible insects. The practice of eating insects is known as entomophagy. Honestly, I don't like the word entomophagy because it is invented by Western people who think that people eat strange things in the tropics. I mean, it's just normal food. We also don't have uh, a word for livestock eating. Arnold Van House has helped build enthusiasm for eating insects. In 2013, he co-authored a book published by Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN, Edible Insects, Future Prospects for Food and Feed Security, which has been downloaded 7 million times. And it got an enormous press coverage. It, it was absolutely amazing. In 2014, we had a conference, uh, Insects to Feed the World. And that was also attended by 450 people from 45 different countries. So I think that was the start worldwide that people started to realize we can eat insects. And if I look now at the number of scientific publications, it's growing exponentially absolutely amazing what has been done the last 10 years. In the U.S. and Europe, insect eating may be unfamiliar, but in other parts of the world, it's part of the regular diet of billions, especially in tropical countries. Insects in the tropics are available throughout the year. In temperate zones, we have a winter time in which there are no insects. Uh, so they're available throughout the year. They're larger, and that has to do with temperature. They have developed much much larger than the insects in the European countries. So for them, it was quite logical uh, to eat insects. So fine, lots of people eat insects. Should they though? Well, in principle, insects are as nutritious as meat. They have all the uh, essential amino acids. But what is also very interesting is that insects may have health benefits. Uh, if you look at the exoskeleton of insects, that is a, a, a substance which is called chitin. And chitin is not uh, synthesized by our body, so it's targeted by our immune system. So it strengthens our immune system. One warning. People who are allergic to shellfish, like shrimp or lobster, might also be allergic to insects. But for those of us who aren't, some research suggests that when we eat chitin, it promotes the growth of healthy gut bacteria. Insects are also high in antioxidants. Some insect extracts pack five times the antioxidant capacity of fresh orange juice. And silkworm fat has double the amount of antioxidants as olive oil. Entomologist Tanya Laddie points out there could be even more benefits. 
there are a projected between five and 10 million different species of insect on the planet, you know, of which we've probably identified maybe 20%. So it's this huge, diverse group. Not all of them are going to be great food sources, um, but there's huge potential that some of them could be really, really great. Most insects are, are high in protein, but they vary quite a lot in how much fat they have. So I think there's a huge potential to be able to really pick and choose amongst the species that we can grow to kind of come up with things that suit the various nutrient needs that we have. Eating insects isn't just good for your body. It's also really good for the planet. It's absolutely better for the planet. And that has to do with many things. They emit much less greenhouse gases than cattle, uh, poultry or pigs. The water use is much less. The land use is is 10 times less. Because one of the real big problems we're facing as a planet is that we need to grow more food to feed a growing population, but we can't really use any more land. You can grow insects in much smaller spaces. And because you don't need to have like perfect, you know, beautiful, um, really good soil or any of the things you need to grow plant protein. Insects are cold-blooded, so they're ectotherms, which means that they don't generate their own body heat. Instead, they rely on the heat from their environment, sunshine, say, to warm up. And that's useful because mammals and other warm-blooded organisms, we use a lot of the energy we eat to generate our body heat. And so that links to something we call the conversion efficiency, which is if I, how much of the energy I feed to that animal am I getting back out? Um, and in vertebrates, it's actually quite low because a lot of that gets burned off as heat. A lot goes into bones and things that we don't really eat. Whereas invertebrates, most of the energy we feed, we can get back out as protein and biomass and stuff we can eat. It takes about 10 pounds of feed to produce just one pound of beef. And for crickets, it's only two. Two kilogram to produce one kilogram of edible product. So much, much better. And then if you also look at what part of an insect you can eat, that's almost 100%. Compare that to pigs and chicken, where only 57% and 65 to 70% of the animal is edible, respectively. They have an exoskeleton, which is quite thin, so in most species we can just pop the whole thing in our mouths. We get a lot more out of them, which is really important when you think about how much agricultural land we currently use just to grow food to feed our food. Many species of insects are also um, what we call gregarious, so they are much happier in kind of very close proximity to one another. And that's also useful from, I think, just an ethical perspective. And so you can rear them in relatively high density conditions without really worrying too much, um, you know, about overcrowding them or, you know, maybe they're unhappy and and such. So, you know, I wouldn't say that like insect protein is better than all the other protein sources and we should only do that. I think it should be a component of a balanced system, which, so it's not saying that we should get rid of livestock. It's not saying we should get rid of plant-based proteins and insects can just play a really important part of that puzzle. Insects also perform a very beneficial task, something called bioconversion. Many of them are able to feed off of things that we probably wouldn't feed to ourselves and we wouldn't feed to animals. So things like food scraps, um, you know, agricultural waste streams, things that are otherwise going to be thrown out, um, perhaps can be then fed to the larva and then that gets turned back into foods. The black soldier fly is something of a champ when it comes to bioconversion. The gold idea would be that you have, say, a farm, um, and that farm has a black soldier fly, say, facility, and they feed all of their waste into that facility, and those soldier flies turn that into larvae that are high in protein, and those maybe get fed back to the livestock or sent off um, as human food. We get this really nice sort of circular economy. So let's all eat insects. But hold on. When we come back, we'll talk about what it's going to take to get insects actually on everyone's plates. Okay, so everything I've heard so far makes eating insects seem like a win, win, win. They're the solution to humanity's food needs. But slow your entomological role. There's still lots of work to do before entomophagy can achieve its full potential. I imagine someone out there might say, like, wait a minute, wait a minute, uh, Tanya, you said insects are are nature's waste management. You know, how do I know that something that lives in garbage and eats (laughs) waste, how is that safe to eat? Isn't that toxic? Isn't it full of bacteria? You know, I would never say like, no, that's definitely not a concern. Just like any animal product, we need to think about hygiene and disease, but it's not different from the other things we already eat. If you've ever been in a place where they're producing um, cattle or 
Um, chickens often, you know, it's not like it's crystal clean and there's no poop everywhere, right? So these are issues that we have to work through whenever we eat animal products, I think. And it's just kind of modifying the procedures we already have in place and using them for insects. You know, we may have to think about which species need to be cooked really well because they could have microbial loads uh, and which species we can eat raw. It's safer to eat insects than to eat meat because vertebrate animals Uh, they have similar diseases as we have for uh, insects that's different. They are taxonomically far apart from from humans. I think in general, insects, they don't have pathogens, especially if they are reared. Uh, If you, of course, collect from nature, you never know the history. And if you then adhere to the normal procedures of cooking, etc., what you do also is normal meat, there is no problem. With safety in mind, Regulations on insects for human consumption can be very stringent. So far, there are only two insect products approved for consumption in the European Union. And we can't yet reap the full benefits of bioconversion. Most of the insects you can buy now, they're not raised on waste. They're mostly raised on a really nice diet of actually quite expensive food that's itself safe to feed to livestock. So that's not necessarily the sustainable way we want to go. I think we want to get to a place where we can feed them things that we're not otherwise using. And so that's going to take some work to kind of figure out, you know, the processes we need to make sure that those are free of contaminants. For example, if you feed maggots on waste, how much bacteria builds up in the maggot? Um, for some species like black soldier flies, before they go into the what looks like a cocoon, turn into the fly, um, they purge their guts so they everything comes out of them pretty much. And that seems to be a really useful um, behavior that may make them have a very low bacterial load. So the first important thing is safety. Next up, it's producing a consistent supply. You know, in some places, it sounds like they have the availability of the insects without necessarily modern technology needed. You know, my mind is now wanting to know if insects are a solution to food insecurity, if insects could be helped to address malnutrition and global food shortages. Well, in the tropics, of course, they are harvested from nature and then prepared, uh, used for home consumption or, or they bring it on the market. But if you really want to promote it, you have to rear them. Rear, that is, raise them. That's the only way. Uh, So efforts are now worldwide underway to rear uh, the different insects. It's a new industry. It's a new agricultural sector. And uh, the production is new. The processing is new. So that needs indeed investments before, you know, you can uh, really bring it in, in large quantities on the market. Maybe it's going to take a superhuman investment to get this off the ground from, say, Iron Man? Here's Robert Downey Jr. on The Late Show with Stephen Colbert talking about a company he's backing. Now, what is this? This looks like I could make cocoa with this. What is right? What is that? Well, uh, that's an insect-based premium protein. It's made from Molitor, which is mealworm larvae. This is a powder derived from the mealworm, and it's a insect protein just been approved by the EU for human consumption. You're not just getting me to eat dirt, are you? <laughs> no, man, I wouldn't play you, bro. Arnold Van House gives us an idea of what mass production of insect products is actually like. I have visited a factory about two years ago, and that was completely automated. They could handle about 40,000 crates a day. And you can stack those crates almost 20 high. And nobody has to be there. It's completely uh, automated. Then, of course, you have to often to wash them. You may have to blanch them as a kind of uh, hygienic process. And, and then you can grind them and then put them in all kinds of food products. That's one possibility. But you can also get the proteins out or get the the fats out and the chitin and you separate those and those you can then put in familiar products. But the most easy is drying, grinding and putting them in food products. Tanya Laddy says a big part of rearing is achieving consistency. For example, with black soldier fly larvae, if you feed them certain things, you can shift sort of the balance of fat and protein in their bodies a little bit. And that's really important because especially if we're growing things for, say, livestock, we need them to have a pretty consistent um, body composition so that we can turn that into a food source that's consistent so that we can get, you know, consistent livestock. 
And there's still a lot to learn about the best insects to eat bioprospecting, if you will. So kind of going out and finding new species. <laughs> because right now, almost all the research for edible insects is really on three or four species. Black soldier fly maggots, crickets, cockroaches, and mealworms. My research group, we recently did some work on an insect in Australia that's related to black soldier flies called the garden soldier fly. Um, and we found that it's just as good as black soldier fly at being able to convert you know, low quality kitchen scraps into protein um, and biomass, but it's happy at much cooler temperatures than black soldier flies. Which would make it easier to raise in more temperate environments. And I think we should just be doing that with a whole bunch of other species as well to really work out which one is going to be the really good one for this climate, which is really high in this particular nutrient, which one is really fast growing. But of course, one big hurdle is what's very technically known as the yuck factor. How do we get people to actually say, okay, I'm going to eat this insect? There are a number of strategies that you can use. Target children because they are not biased yet. Research on the development of children's food preferences suggests teaching them to eat insects before they start making their own food choices at about three or four years old. Call them something else, like sky shrimps, if you talk about grasshoppers. Uh, if you bring something on the market, which is already difficult for the people, then make it tasty. But I think the big challenge is in future is to put it in familiar products like hamburgers or sausages so you don't recognize the insects and then season them in a very nice way. Especially in Western countries, we don't necessarily have a long cultural history of preparing insects. And so we don't necessarily know how to prepare them in the way that makes them the most delicious. You think of like, I don't know, steak or chicken. If you had no idea how to cook them in a way that made them tasty, they still wouldn't be very good. You know, if you just you know chucked your chicken in the microwave, <laughs> like, well, this is dry and flavorless. <laughs> like, So I think there's going to need to be a lot of work in figuring out how to market it, um, how to cook it in good ways and getting people on board. And that's probably looking towards cultures that already do a really good job of cooking insects and, you know, getting some insight from them about the best ways to prepare them. Arnold Van House even co-authored a cookbook called The Insect Cookbook, Food for a Sustainable Planet. If you prepare insects right, he says, Try it the first time and the second time is no problem anymore. So we put that to the test. Two of our producers, Rosalind and Sandra, celebrated our last episode of the season with a brunch, a cricket brunch that is, with a pair of artists who raise crickets in their New York City apartments. Adam Chad Brody and Jude Talache make music with crickets, host educational events, and then cook and eat them. They hope their art and lifestyle will get people to try crickets for that very first time. But the first ones that we harvested, they lived in my apartment for three months mm -hmm. and made the city so much nicer because <laughs> there's all the construction noise and all the traffic. You have this constant companion of them yeah. chirping. And even at night, you know, yeah. it feels like it's summer year round. Whenever you feel like it, you can grab one over there and try it. These are all spicy. Hmm. Trying to think what to compare it to. So is there vinegar in the there? Vinegar yeah, so there's lime, like a sour, okay. Garlic. Sometimes I tell people that they're lamb shrimp. <laughs> yeah, so there's a nice crunch and then there's a little juiciness that comes out when you when you chew. What we do is we harvest them. After about three or four months, we take them out of their cricket houses and then we put them in a refrigerator and they go dormant. And then we put them in the freezer. We're hoping that that's the most humane, you know, that they just go to sleep and then they go more to sleep. And then they, and then, then after they're frozen for a little while, then we take them out and do this, where we cook with them and, and spice them. Now I'm adding the marinated crickets into the, um, into the fajita blend. The amount of crickets in this dish, it's about, I think we did the calculation last night, Jude, it's about 30 grams of protein. So it's more protein than if we added beef into this. When we started the project, it wasn't necessarily about wanting to be healthier or, or, um, or even really about environmental impact. I think it was more about like a need that I had where I was like, I'm living in a city where I, I wanted to have like a a daily, a daily thing that I was doing that was directly contributing to 
to survival. <laughs> we could raise insects in our apartments pretty easily, and crickets were just such a clear winner because they chirp. And we can make music with them. <laughs> and because they're, they're cute. Jump, cricket, jump, jump. Jump, cricket, jump, cricket, jump, cricket, jump, cricket, jump, cricket, jump, cricket, jump, jump. Adam and Jude have big hopes for crickets in New York City. Every block in the city has its own little cricket farm where the crickets are eating gardens. <laughs> where the crickets are eating garden matter and, and food scraps, and you know people are gathering their crickets and cooking them. Tanya Laddie has a similar vision for the future. They're small enough that people could do it in their homes, even. Like you can imagine a future where maybe you have your, your black soldier fly production facility in the back and you throw in your food scraps and you get out, you know, maggot burgers. <laughs> One of the unfortunate things I think has happened a lot more recently is that we're starting to realize that insects are not bulletproof. You know, they are everywhere, but many groups are in decline. And that's going to come back and bite us. You know, if we keep walking around going, ah, oh, I don't care about insects and I kind of hate them and I wish they were all gone, you know, we, we might get what we wish for. And that would be, you know, terrible, <laughs> you know, catastrophically bad. They are such a huge chunk of the biodiversity that it would be tragic, tragic to lose anymore. Not to mention all the ecosystem services they provide, which we've discussed so if you're not yet convinced and you're not ready to start your own cricket farm just yet, Tanya Laddie has a few recommendations. Honestly, caring is probably the first step. We need to be aware that there's a problem and care about that problem before we can do anything. So just telling everybody that you can is a good step. On a personal level, I think not using insecticides as much as you can is really important. I also always recommend planting flowers, weirdly, which is beautiful because you get lots of flowers. But it's not just pollinating insects, like lots of bees, flies, um, butterflies, all those pollinating insects love flowers, but also lots of predators do too. So things like um, spiders are even known to drink nectar, um, ladybugs, lacewings, assassin bugs, all these insects that will also help keep your pest population down. And as for our producers, Rosalind and Sandra, who tried those crickets, dare I ask, would they venture out and have another insect meal? I enjoyed them. The flavor is pretty neutral, so they take on the flavor of whatever seasonings you put. And this time they made them really spicy and garlicky. And the texture reminded me a lot of some other snacks that we have in the Philippines, like tiny crispy shrimp. Yes, I will totally try them again. It was my first time, so it was a challenge. But once I uh, was over the eek factor, they are actually delicious, very crunchy. Though, full disclosure, I don't think it can eat worms. If you want to learn more about the advantages and challenges of eating insects and see some pretty gorgeous images of a lot of the creatures and dishes we talked about today, check out Nova's Edible Insects, now streaming on the PBS video app and on Nova's YouTube channel, Nova PBS Official. Nova Now is a production of GBH and PRX. It's produced by... Terrence Bernardo, Ari Daniel, Jocelyn Gonzalez, Isabel Hibbert, Sandra Lopez Monsalve, and Rosalind Tordesillas. Julia Court and Chris Schmidt are the co executive producers of Nova. Suki Bennett is senior digital editor. Christina Monin is associate researcher. Robin Kasmer is science editor. Robert Boyd is digital associate producer. And Devin Robbins is managing producer of podcasts at GBH. Our theme music makes people dance right out of their cocoon. It's by DJ Kid Koala. Starting next week, for five consecutive weeks, we have a special podcast series for you. Nova Now Universe Revealed. Blast off with us to explore alien worlds, galaxies, stars, black holes, and the start of the universe itself, the Big Bang. Our podcast series coincides with the five-part documentary series entitled Nova Universe Revealed, airing Wednesdays on PBS and streaming now on the PBS video app. I'm Alok Patel. Thank you for joining us on the second season of Nova Now. It's been a science field journey with all of you as we chatted about exercise physiology using tech to solve droughts, UFOs, where we're at with COVID vaccines and variants, the future of electric vehicles, safely sending kids back to school in a pandemic, the smoky truth about cannabis, the crypto behind cryptocurrency, and last but not least, the wonderful, delicious, sustainable world of edible insects. Until we meet again, stay healthy and stay curious. GBH.